Hey, Cypher here. Yeah, that's a pretty strong title, but I have no other recourse. It is actually quite truthful, and I'll explain why in just a bit. I need to put this thing together really quickly because Team YouTube might try to cover their butt and undo all of their misdeeds right before I can even release it. Despite YouTube's guidelines making clear exceptions for historical content, they have repeatedly suppressed that. History tubers have been dealing with this for quite some time, and it's time to raise awareness. Also, I've created a playlist called Project Demonized, because, well, I'm trying to put this thing together rather quickly, and some folks can't put it together a video that quickly. And so, I'm going to be linking to that in the description, and where you can find other people talking about this kind of historical suppression through YouTube's guidelines. This is a community under attack by the very platform that proclaims its support. So go ahead and voice your anger in the comments, or in some other way, like on social media or something along those lines. I can feel your anger. It gives you focus, makes you stronger. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the heat flow through you. I have a lot to say and very little time to put this all together. For years, Team YouTube has aided and abetted conspiracy theorists of all sorts, including genocide deniers, and now they have suppressed content about the Holocaust. When I say Team YouTube, I don't mean YouTube as a whole, but the people who run it. At the top of this malignant mountain is Susan Wojcicki, but every rung of the corporate ladder is implicated, including Google's CEO, Sundar Pichai. This is why we cannot allow monopolies to form. If there is anything I hope you take away from this video, it's that a simple policy adjustment is not enough. Team YouTube is systematically corrupt and incapable of allowing a market competitor. There is no platform worth posting videos on besides YouTube. All others cannot compete. YouTube is a monopoly, one that's nested within another monopoly. The only answer is trust busting Google, hell, maybe nationalizing it can't be worse than letting a corporation rule over public education. They have too much power, to the point of suppressing history itself. Take to Twitter or whatever social media, air your grievances, and make ending this corporate autocracy a top legislative priority. We have no rights, and I do mean that literally, we have no rights, on YouTube until the US federal government steps in. It is a private platform. This isn't just about demonetization, which often explicitly violates their own rules. This isn't just about their inability to follow their own community guidelines. This isn't even about their wonky copyright system, nor their cozying up to old media to the detriment of actual YouTubers. No, this is about how all of these things combine to create a policy of suppressing historical content. It's not a coherent policy, but it is a policy nonetheless, whether intentional or not. Through Team YouTube's actions, they have proven themselves to be genocide deniers. The pipelines of hatred aren't incidental artifacts of an algorithm that tends towards more extreme content. It's so much worse than that. The radicalization of the internet is by design, for the profit of Team YouTube. At this point, I don't care how many bridges I burn with bigots. For those upset that I use the word, or that I'm being too politically biased, piss off. Defending bigotry is still bigotry, and I'll call a bigot a bigot because bigot is the best word for bigots. Also, bigotry is on any side of the political spectrum, but most prevalent on the far right. I make no apologies for fighting that which opposes the very existence of my profession. If that makes me too biased for you, then you clearly do not care about actual history. The fact is, YouTube makes a tremendous amount of their money from allowing bigotry to exist on their system, and now they are actively enabling that by suppressing content that can actually fight bigotry. 
I'm a believer in Hanlon's razor, which says, Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Well, Team YouTube's pattern of behavior has gone beyond the realm where we can adequately explain it as simple stupidity. They have actively violated their own guidelines in favor of suppressing educational content, especially that which fights bigotry, and that is what this video is all about. I will not sit idly by as this platform becomes one that suppresses Holocaust history. So it is time to air some grievances, not just with these recent videos, which we'll get to, but with their entire policy of suppressing historical content and the contemptible implications of denialism. I'm sorry that I can't make this look fancy or entertaining, but it is a story that needs to be told as quickly as possible, for it is a deep issue driving the kind of heinous acts we saw on January 6th. Internet bigotry is not a mere accidental exposure, but one designed by tech giants like Team YouTube for their benefit and our increasing harm. Long before my channel became popular, before even the adpocalypse, history channels were targeted by Team YouTube. For a time, beginning in about 2015, they removed monetization of anything referring to war whatsoever. This had the effect of lowering any video's ability to arise in the algorithm. They effectively made military history impossible to discuss openly. The topic was basically verboten. We had to skirt around the issue by using weasel words like conflict and hostilities. As long as the word war wasn't in the description, tags, or title, the video could see a modicum of success, but they'd find those videos every once in a while and yank the rug out from under them anyways, halting their viewership immediately. So the adpocalypse in 2017 kind of came as a relief for some history channels, including myself. YouTube had actively demonetized our content, but old media such as news agencies and newspapers and whatnot got a huge boost in sales from reporting about Team YouTube monetizing terrorist videos and thereby supporting those terrorist groups. Yeah, that's what caused the adpocalypse. Team YouTube trying to cover their asses after they had supported terrorism through monetizing terrorist videos. Despite the fact Team YouTube was already demonetizing historical content. Advertisers fled when they saw that their money was going towards hate groups, so YouTube demonetized those channels. Which makes them demonetizing content kind of the same as equivalating that channel to terrorists. Advertisers were concerned with paying for hate, as in the people behind the videos, not with the actual content. Leave it to the largest advertising firm in the world, as in Google, to not understand what advertisers actually want. So their policy was already idiotic in the first place. But at least this new yellow dollar sign of demonetization could be appealed, and often went through. They manually approved any history videos back in 2017. War was no longer a thing that Team YouTube systematically suppressed, hence why so many military history channels popped up. There were problems though. Certain words would still get demonetized, including literally just the word history. You'd have to appeal it. The problem was that while it was demonetized, it would be suppressed algorithmically. They can't make money from demonetized videos. Some ads might play on such videos, but they are far less, and the cut of ads is a significant chunk of YouTube's revenue. To get a manual review, you have to get at least a thousand views in a week. Coupled with the suppression, some videos would never get reviewed. I still have some in limbo like that, even today after years of demonetization pending review. It was weird and annoying, but mostly fine as long as I caught the demonetization before it was too suppressed. This algorithmic suppression is my main concern with demonetization, not the lack of money. I now have a very generous amount of people on Patreon. I'm to the point that I could easily go full time on here and not have to worry too much about my livelihood. Sure, fluctuations are troubling, but not enough to think that I couldn't do it. Besides, I'm going to finish my dissertation and teaching alongside it, but who knows what might be in store once I'm done in a year or two. So while it would be nice to make more cash, it's not my concern. Suppression is. A sad case was my only viral video. The Slave Myths episode initially rocketed in popularity. It was even manually reviewed and approved beforehand. Funny enough, I put it out because President Trump made some stupid remarks about the Civil War that week. 
On day one, it was pretty popular, but then the second day was crazy. By the Monday after that weekend, I had so much traffic coming my way, I didn't know how to handle it. Tens of thousands of people watched it every few minutes, and it kept gaining momentum. Plus, the comments were bad. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of threats. I literally carried a pistol concealed in my waistband for two weeks, even at work, because I was legitimately worried for my life. So perhaps it was a relief when Team YouTube demonetized the video for a second time. That slowed its viewership immediately to a tiny percentage of what it had been. I got a quick manual review, and it was reapproved. But the video never took off like that again. In fact, none have. Every modicum of success since then has been hindered by Team YouTube interference. Almost every episode that reaches 10,000 views will have gone through some kind of trouble on the back end. It's a problem that I used to think was just incompetence. I'll hear people saying that they're trying to suppress free speech, which is certainly not the case. No one has such a right on a private platform. You want this so-called free speech here, then you want to silence the platform's owners. Your free speech ends at joining a private platform. That not only goes for YouTube, that also goes for individual channels. Imagine if somebody went into a history museum and started yelling about conspiracy theories. They'd rightfully be thrown out of there like the bigot they are. This is the basis of my policy, bigots get banned. By definition, it is impossible to reasonably engage with bigotry. No amount of evidence and reason can dissuade them. Hence why such rhetoric is not countenanced in public history institutions. This is a public history channel, which is how I will continue to operate, no matter how many people misunderstand their so-called free speech. What's especially hypocritical of these free speech warriors is that they believe this is specifically aiming for a particular part of the political spectrum. Almost always, they think the targets are conservatives, but leftists are equally, if not disproportionately, attacked by Team YouTube. Which leads to the next problem. Far-right groups regularly attack historical content. Ultranationalism, or fascism, functions by proclaiming their revival of a mythical past. When that myth is shattered by studying history, these bigots lash out in an attempt to suppress that. A historian's job is studying the past, including the dark and difficult parts, not their imaginary version of it. Denying history because it wounds a nation's fragile ego isn't patriotism, it's the worst form of nationalism. Tarnish their nation's supposed glory, and fascists will eagerly commit whatever violence necessary to silence you. My channel has been the recipient of several 4chan mass flagging campaigns. Normally this is blown up in their faces like the petulant children they are. The video might get demonetized, or even have some other problem, but it used to always go in my favor. Remember the Death of Stalin review? How about the Lost Cause episode? Yeah, 4chan raided those. They even hit the Slave Myths video multiple times. I think my Soviet Myths video got hit as well, but I'm not sure of that. All of these campaigns, I profited tremendously from their hatred. Yep, negative interactions are still interactions, which feeds the algorithm and boosts my videos. A simple trick is to simply disable comments, and then the idiots have to go to another video, giving me even more interaction. It's kind of hilarious when you think about it. I benefit from banning bigots. It's not just an ethical stance, it helps the channel. They'll yell their trash into the void while I'll laugh all the way to the bank. They can say whatever they want, nothing is stopping them, but they don't get to be published on my platform. See how that works? Funny how free speech warriors can't figure that out. I'll see folks claiming this is hypocritical, but such a claim lacks any understanding of what they speak. Plus, I just take great pleasure in banning bigots and deleting falsehoods. They aren't worthy of this channel. It's really quite funny. But YouTube is not just some historian working out of his house. YouTube is an international corporation. The problem with these attacks is that Team YouTube will sometimes validate them. I've had a couple community guidelines strikes over the years. One was for my History of Feminism video. They took it down for two weeks before the appeal went through. So I had that strike for two weeks, but then they removed it. Another was for an admittedly edgy shitpost I called Humanizing Hitler. This basically said, 
Lol. He was a vegetarian, anti-smoking, and managed to stave off the Great Depression, so even a genocidal maniac has a homelier side. <laughs> yeah, it was boorish bordering on backward, but it wasn't anything beyond the pale. Of course, that mass flagging went through, and on that one, I decided to just deal with it. The episode didn't actually violate community guidelines, sure, but two years after its release, I didn't like the video anyways. Some episodes were remaining demonetized after manual review. For instance, that feminism video did. Around that time, there was kind of a perfect balance of demonetization between stuff that could be construed as liberal or conservative. For instance, my 13 Hours and Snowden reviews were demonetized alongside the feminism and US veterans episodes. The veterans one was extra insulting because I poured my heart into that one, specifically for the 100th anniversary of the armistice that day represents. Team YouTube suppressed it while at the same time promoting their own in-house productions of random half-assed interviews and old media feel-good tokenization. They literally were suppressing veterans and feminist history simultaneously while proclaiming the opposite. It's almost like they tried to strike a political balance while they violated their own guidelines. They make specific provisions that educational content may be monetized. Every form of these guidelines has made that provision, so they are in fact violating their own guidelines. Of course, with enough complaining on social media and to the actual Team YouTube members at VidCon, all four of those videos were re-monetized after about a year. There's plenty of others that have been demonetized. I've had as many as 40 at a time, and as few as 15, all of which were suppressed algorithmically. As soon as they get demonetized, the amount of viewership slows to a trickle. A year ago, I was still convinced this was incompetence, not animosity. A video praising feminism might be seen as hatred if one doesn't bother to watch it. That so-called manual review has always been quite suspect. Hell, I was making fun of Team YouTube for that exact reason only a few weeks ago. Sure, this showed their inability to support educational content. We're setting a new goal to double the number of users who engage with educational content on YouTube. But I chalked that up to ineptitude. Still, something weird started to happen, which we call sneak demonetization. Essentially, a video would be manually approved for monetization, and then months, if not years after the fact, they just demonetize it anyways. There's at least four videos hit by this currently, so even the approval of a video is not a guarantee, because they'll come right back around and demonetize the video anyways. On these videos, I never requested another review, they never gave me that option. Team YouTube just swept in after months of these being okayed by a supposed staff member, and then suddenly, they changed that willy-nilly out of the blue, no warning, not even a goddamned email. I literally have to check the monetization status of my backlog regularly because of Team YouTube's malfeasance. The ones they've chosen to sneak demonetize make no sense. There's no connection between these. Plus, sometimes, they'll just randomly decide to re-monetize something after I've complained loudly about it. There's no coherence between these. No connecting thread. Just that they hate history and want to suppress anything that isn't cool battles and whatnot. Deep analysis was now the target. As long as Team YouTube censors could catch it. Happy, fun history? That's cool! Honest, painstaking, and thought-provoking history? Nah. Can't have them users thinking. How would Team YouTube maintain their power? That is where it was by about the beginning of 2020. YouTube was simply against anything with depth. They didn't want people educating themselves. And history tubers like myself who wanted to skirt that could easily make the beginning of their videos simplistic. But that changed throughout the year. They'd already shown signs of a far rightward shift. After all, Team YouTube regularly appeased fascist mass flagging campaigns, especially of lefty tuber content. I guess people like the term bread tuber, but lefty tuber makes more sense to me. Just think of how many channels you might have been exposed to because a bunch of lefty tubers re uploaded something that Team YouTube took down to appease fascists. Half the lefty tuber channels that I know of came from this. It was commonplace. First, they came for the lefty tubers, and I remained silent. Besides, with the unity of these channels mirroring each other's downed videos, Team YouTube would have to cripple themselves to completely remove them. A further sign was the fact that YouTube regularly plays ads on history tuber content for disinformation campaigns from reactionaries and even worse, like PragerU and the Epoch Times. 
So Team YouTube gets a material benefit from reactionaries. And let us not forget their sheer amount of conspiracy theory BS that YouTube is filled with. There's entire conspiracist channels that remain on the platform and fully monetized. Their algorithm also tends to send massive amounts of these bigots from such channels to history tubers. Team YouTube was poised to implement a policy of historical suppression. It should have been obvious with the case of the casual historian's video, Appropriating Legitimacy. It's about the rise of Holocaust denial. Team YouTube, in their infinite wisdom, took it down for the very thing it was against. After half a year, they did issue a flaccid apology to Grant in person, and I was complaining loudly at that point, but not enough, for I should have seen the writing on the wall. Team YouTube had effectively announced that they were no longer just appeasing fascists, they clearly sided with fascists. Everyone in 2019 was more concerned with some Vox reporter being attacked by an idiot reactionary. Sure, the guy used slurs and whatnot, but the outrage on the internet was purely on behalf of big brands. No one cared about history tubers getting attacked. The very channel who attacked the Vox reporter had offhandedly attacked my Slave Myths video a year prior, but not a single iota of care was thrown towards anyone else the man had attacked. Team YouTube was not favoring anyone here, and even demonetized the reactionary's entire channel, while the Vox reporter created his own channel with much promotion from YouTube. All the while, the people without corporate backing had to shoulder the burden of what was to come. Corporations on YouTube play by a different rule set. They can run their own ads, but even when they have the standard monetization scheme as actual YouTubers, they are automatically given preferential treatment within the algorithm. This is old media conquering new media, and Team YouTube is happy to let it happen because they are paid substantially from this. Without the worry of backlash from old media, they can avoid another adpocalypse. Well, 2020 was truly a horrendous year in many regards, one of which was Team YouTube's steady shift towards bigotry. Remember that demonetization results in the suppression of a video within the algorithm. We see repeatedly, when a video gets a manual review as remaining demonetized, it instantly loses its momentum. There are some exceptions to this. For instance, my Lost Cause video performed exceptionally well, but that was more because of its popularity on other social media platforms, such as Twitter and Reddit. Plus there was that harassment campaign from 4chan, which actually helped the episode instead of hurting it like they wanted. But look at what they chose to demonetize through the year. The Lost Cause myth, sectional crisis, police brutality, and Soviet myths response. I thought with the Lost Cause one, it was simply because there was the Confederate flag in the thumbnail, nothing more sinister than that. But then with the sectional crisis video, when pushed to provide an explanation for why it was labeled as having a focus on accidents, pranks, or stunts that have health risks, like drinking or eating non-edibles, or discussing trending videos that show this type of content. The spokesperson I was emailing stated, It contains excessive amount of tobacco-related content that are above safety threshold. Now, this right here is a lie. There is no mention of tobacco or even smoking in that video. Not a single one. What that video is about is the 1850s sectional crisis that preceded the Civil War, and it is kind of an underhanded way of beating back the lost cause once again. The video was suppressed, but I thought Team YouTube was just being stupid. Boy, was I wrong. I knew the police brutality video would be demonetized, despite the fact that their policy explicitly states that educational content may be monetized. Luckily, that one too had a huge outpouring of support on social media, though it did not perform as well as it could have. Suppression of that kind of content was assured. But then came the Soviet myth's comments response. Once again, it was demonetized for strange reasons, claiming that there were graphic dead bodies in a non-educational video. Well, I contacted Team YouTube via email again, and this time got a timestamp for this supposedly non-educational violent imagery. And guess where they pointed it out? Yep, the Holodomor. They specifically claimed that imagery of the Holodomor was non-educational. Three million dead Ukrainians would like to differ. I called it out as atrocity denial even then, and I was furious. But I let my anger subside. I really shouldn't have. But that video was made specifically to shut up all the idiotic comments I'd been seeing, and that job was accomplished regardless of its algorithmic suppression. 
Anger can accomplish a lot, but it is difficult to maintain under such circumstances. With the coming of 2021, the beginning of this year seems to just be the season finale of 2020, or as historians often like to call these wonky timelines, the long 2020. We had an insurrection in the capital, and now an American company trying to suppress the very history that would stop such events from happening. Combined with Twitter shutting down all speech related to the instigator of that insurrection, the recent crackdown on small traders doing the same kind of reckless betting on Wall Street that the government has allowed elites to do unhampered for centuries, and Republicans continuing to allow conspiracy theorists within their party to hold positions of power. These things are not disconnected. The 40-year political norm finally sees a popular challenge by common people. Team YouTube is actively trying to support the status quo, where bigots are allowed to flourish unchallenged so long as they don't make too much noise. Their actions prove this. My first video of the year was the causes of the war on terror. It was demonetized and clearly suppressed within the algorithm. Why would a company that profits from the war want to stop people from understanding it? Gee, I wonder why. It's kinda obvious, really. Once again, there is a specific exception carved out in YouTube's policy stating it may be monetized if educational. So by doing this by manual review, they are clearly stating that they do not deem people learning about the largest war since Vietnam to be educational. Team YouTube benefits from this war's continuation, and preventing people from learning about it allows Team YouTube to continue benefiting from all the funding that is pumped into their system for such ads as military recruiting and whatnot. There's a long history of silencing people, especially history, in order to maintain a war effort. There's the Alien and Sedition Acts of the 1790s to the Espionage and Sedition Acts of World War I. Both the Alien and Espionage Acts are still on the books and used regularly. This is just a corporation maintaining that because history doesn't fit the propaganda. And when I say propaganda, I mean actual propaganda, not like how the internet seems to label anything they don't like as propaganda. Propaganda is meant to propagate information on behalf of a powerful entity, that entity being the US federal government. What do you think looking at the causation of a war makes people question its continuation? Because that doesn't fit the US military's propaganda. Hence why my video had to be suppressed. I'm sure my video about the history of US insurrections that I'll be releasing before this will also be demonetized and suppressed. At this point, it's obvious that if the content actually presents a significant challenge to bigotry, especially the violent form that we saw on January 6th, then Team YouTube will do what they can to lower its visibility, which is what they indicated only a couple weeks ago with the worst form of bigotry possible, atrocity denial. As part of a large collaboration between YouTube channels called Project Shoah, I made a review of Schindler's List. It includes a history of the Holocaust as part of the reality section. Everyone else kind of skirted away from the topic because this is what could happen. I think the episode is pretty damn good, especially since I had a Holocaust scholar actually helping me revise the episode to make it better. But now, I know why I've never seen a history of the Holocaust on this platform. Team YouTube age-restricted the video, officially making sure that no high schooler was allowed to see it. Yes, they think that high schoolers shouldn't learn about the Holocaust, apparently. But even worse, they delisted it from search and from my subscribers. Currently, if you go back to find the video in your subscription feed, that is, if you're a subscriber, you will not find it. It's gone. Search in the search bar the terms Cynical Historian Schindler's List. You will not find it. Try to go through connected or recommended videos, you will not find it. The only way to get to it is to go onto my channel and look through uploads, click a direct link, or go through the collaboration's overall playlist. That's it. That's the only way you can access a history of the Holocaust. Hey, Later Cypher here. Team YouTube now has this episode listed in search, and some people have been getting it recommended, but it's still not in anyone's subscription feed. I had more than 50 independent users verify this shadow ban, so them relisting it does not erase the fact that they suppressed a history of the Holocaust and still actively deny that high schoolers should learn about it. 
The first day, it was not age-restricted, and was the best performing video I've had on its first day. Though we did have a problem with Team YouTube deleting comments across the collab, including from all of its participants. The second day, it got age-restricted and shadow banned, so the performance turned to the worst I've had in years. This suppression is so effective that even if they reverse the shadow ban, that episode will never recover from the algorithmic suppression. Team YouTube has effectively prevented anyone who is searching on this platform to learn about the Holocaust from doing so. On top of all of that, I've had at least five subscribers say they were unsubscribed against their will following this video, and many more generally have had my videos fail to appear in their subscription feed. So I got in contact, demanding an explanation as to why they would go so far as to not only block high schoolers from learning about the Holocaust on their platform, but also anyone who does not have a direct link to it. After all, that very day, Susan Wojcicki actively promoted a video from the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Remember, old media plays by a different rule set on this platform. It was Holocaust Remembrance Day, so she had to at least pretend to care about the topic, even though her company was actively engaging in Holocaust denial. This needed an explanation, and you know what they said? We heard back and your video was correctly age-restricted for showing graphic violence footage, which might be disturbing for certain age people. They said that publicly on Twitter. Publicly. Well, of course it's disturbing. That's the point. As one reply said to them, It was a goddamn genocide, you morally bankrupt hacks. You bastards are part of the problem. And I fully agree with this sentiment. If the Holocaust isn't fucking disturbing, then you are either a denialist or actively want it to happen again, which is the same goddamn thing in my book. Their guidelines do currently state that graphic content may be age-restricted even if it is educational, though they once said quite the opposite, and there's nothing about shadow banning. But think about what that age restriction does. They have a kids app, so this restriction specifically applies to 14 to 18 year olds. Meaning, high schoolers are blocked from learning about the Holocaust. This is no longer a mistake. They said it publicly. How the hell am I supposed to make videos about such topics as genocides and massacres without showing the goddamn bodies? People are shown this imagery at a very young age, in schools all around the world. Heck, I know I saw Schindler's List in high school. It is an integral part of preventing another industrial genocide. To not show that would be to allow denialists further opportunity to deny it. Which unfortunately appears to be what Team YouTube wants. It doesn't take much to go find videos of Holocaust denial on this website. It took Team YouTube years to remove the most blatant ones, and they only did so reluctantly after old media made a spectacle of it. The reason being is that they profit from bigotry. That is a substantial amount of their user base. As Santayana said about American history, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Hell, the American Historical Association, which is the highest professional historian organization in this country, and one I have received tremendous support from, began in 1884 with the quote, History is past politics and politics present history. So all those who say, keep politics out of history, don't know a damn thing about the topic. This is a sonorous war cry of a very angry frog. Those complaints are almost always from right-wing dimwits who simply want to return to nationalist history as though the history profession froze before the civil rights movement's accomplishments graced the pages of history. Denying the educational value of teaching about humanity's dark past is to support it taking place again. That is what Team YouTube is doing. To pretend that teaching about atrocities is non-educational is not only a denial of what the history profession is, it is outright dangerous. Here are some other history tubers who had the time to make a short clip for this quickly. They too want to voice their grievances. At the end of 2020, alongside the general election, New Zealand had a pair of referendums. One of these referendums was on the legalization of cannabis. I, as a semi-amateur YouTuber and Kiwi, elected to make a video looking back at the campaign. 
Immediately on release, the video did well. After two hours, YouTube's anxiety-inducing ranking widget ranked the video number one of my recent videos, complete with adorable animated fireworks. But no sooner than I had made the obligatory tweet celebrating success, something changed. The once green monetization icon turned yellow. Representatives of YouTube, of course, are quick to tell creators to upload their videos a couple of hours in advance, so their algorithms have time to run, and creators aren't caught out by these type of post-release surprises. But this video was uploaded a whole day earlier, to give my wonderful patrons a chance to watch it early, with a green monetization icon that entire time. Like many of the other monetization issues on YouTube, this is an example of a good idea, poorly executed. YouTube reps also tell us that the promotion and monetization systems are entirely separate. That may be true, but it's of no comfort. This only means there is another bot checking the content for its appropriateness for the algorithm to share. Why would anyone expect that bot to do a better job than the demonetization bot, or the human reviewer that follows it? Speaking of human reviewers, they confirmed you shouldn't talk about a cannabis referendum on their platform. The yellow icon would stay. Four days later, the views on the video had gone up in smoke. After the first two hours where ads were running, the video had received 2,957 views, compared to 2,653 views for the previous video, also related to the New Zealand election. But by day four, that video had amassed 43,725 views, while the now demonetized referendum video sat at just 10,052. It's easy to see why the views dropped in YouTube analytics. At that point, only 31.7% of impressions came from YouTube recommended your content, compared to 83.3% for the previous video. YouTube's passive-aggressive tooltip helpfully tells me you can increase the chance of YouTube suggesting your content by increasing your click-through rate and your video watch time. But the click-through rate and watch time were actually better on the referendum video, so that's not what's causing the views to plummet. The difference is the monetization status. Demonetization led to demonization. Though one unprofitable and suppressed video isn't a massive problem for a channel, with the reviewers disagreeing with my rating, I now have a black mark on my record of self-rating. And with YouTube's inconsistency, the only way to even attempt to prevent another one is to avoid any potentially controversial topic. So I wasn't part of Project Shoah. One less creator stood up against anti-Semitism because of YouTube's policies. As for the referendum, it failed. The vote was exceptionally close. A swing of less than 35,000 votes would have changed the result. So I'm left wondering, if YouTube suppressed my video, made by a no voter because it promoted drug use, how much did they and other social media giants suppress content supporting the yes vote? Is that level of influence a power we want these companies to have? Hi, I'm Dr. Zar from History and Headlines. I make videos on YouTube both as a learning resource for my students and also for the general public's education and entertainment. Unfortunately, a few dozen of my channel's videos are either not monetized at all or have limited monetization due to ad suitability and or age restrictions. Not only does the lack of full monetization of these videos result in a lack of any substantial earnings from these videos, it also appears to mean that these videos are not likely to be recommended by YouTube's algorithm. After all, why would YouTube recommend videos that are not earning them ad revenue? My concern, though, is not merely about spending many hours editing videos only for them to not generate any income for me. Rather, it is disturbing that several of the demonetized videos on my channel involve topics of genuine educational value and do not depict anything that would reasonably be considered not ad-friendly. For example, why would a video about the Tuskegee Airmen have limited monetization? Why would a video about a test launch of a missile have limited monetization? Despite covering topics associated with wars, these videos do not depict graphic violence. In the case of the former, the video is intended as a commemoration of notable African American airmen that I made for inclusion in my Timeline of Black History playlist for Black History Month. Why would YouTube want to suppress such a video? In the case of the latter, the video about the missile launch, one of a number of videos about technology on my channel that are not monetized, that video's focus is on a technological development rather than on any kind of bloody war violence. Still, probably the most ironic demonetization 
version on my channel is of a short video about the bonfire of the vanities that discusses a historic example of extreme censorship. Today, in an age already characterized as cancel culture run amok, suppressing YouTube videos about 15th century censorship, about the achievements of African American aviation heroes, and about how the Holocaust is remembered in popular culture, as in the case with the cynical historian's recent video, is a clear form of electronic book burning. Hi, I'm the creator of EDU2, a channel which makes history videos for kids, and I used to work with a Holocaust educational channel called the Responsible History Education Action in 2013 through 2015. That nonprofit channel was aimed at educating people in Thailand about the Holocaust because it wasn't taught in many schools at all, while Nazi images and anti-Semitism were becoming more prevalent in Thai pop culture. The videos we produced were some of the only ones that had Thai language, emphasizing storytelling and empathy. But it was also necessary to show the horrors of what happened to make it clear. That channel was not created to make AdSense revenue. It was made to serve as a resource for Thai speakers, which didn't exist elsewhere on YouTube. YouTube is one of the places where Nazi imagery was filtered into Thai culture, and other videos on the platform in Thai language glorify or lack context when referencing Nazis. You know it's bad when John Oliver does a whole segment on it. We uploaded some footage taken by U.S. troops of the concentration camps and made it available as a primary resource with ample content warnings. Because this footage was created by the U.S. government, it's in the public domain and cannot be copyrighted by anyone. Keeping this video up on YouTube took a lot of my time because it was copyright claimed several times, removed, and then allowed back on the platform to be age-gated. I had to refute every copyright claim, and all of the claimants were for-profit channels that never responded to the counterclaim. Not all these claimants were copyright trolls. Many are film industry channels, and they also failed to respond to any emails, tweets, and social media posts trying to shame them into taking back their false claims. As a result, every claim took down my video for 30 days before it expired. Then YouTube sent an email saying the video had been flagged for review, and after review, they determined that it violated community guidelines and removed it from YouTube. After I disputed this decision, it was reinstated and then age-gated. I went and checked the videos that copyright claimed the exact same footage to find those videos were not age-gated. So I concluded that YouTube was not interested in hosting educational content about the Holocaust, but were fine with videos that glorify it. Having content constantly taken off the platform for copyright strikes and then countering the flagging and age-gating felt like a constant fight that I was always losing. Volunteering to do this work was already emotionally exhausting, and I never imagined YouTube would be the entity that took up most of my time fighting against. That's why I gave up making content with Holocaust educational materials and switched to content for younger learners. I learned that YouTube doesn't want to look at context or deal with its hate speech problems. And with YouTube's new COPPA guidelines, once again, educational channels get much less leeway than Troom Troom. YouTube. Hey guys, Trey the Explainer here. Yeah, as Cypher said, YouTube's current policies can really hurt content creators that make videos on what they very vaguely define as controversial content. Now, although I mostly handle quote-unquote non-controversial subjects like dinosaurs, archaeology, and Bigfoot, I've had to deal with the same problems other YouTubers have. The one example that sticks on my mind is my video on homosexuality and animals and nature. The video was an examination of the scientific evidence that suggests same-sex behavior in animals and humans is entirely natural. It didn't show anything more graphic than your standard BBC nature documentary, nor did I say anything beyond what is commonly accepted in the scientific community. However, simply mentioning that these animals were gay caused YouTube to freak out and demonetize the video pretty much instantly. I tried to dispute it, but to no avail. I really wanted the video to serve as an insightful display of the evidence for people unaware of the extensive scientific research on this often misunderstood topic. 
Although I can't really confirm this, I suspect that the YouTube algorithm likely hid the video from some of my audience due to a significant dip in viewership, as well as some subscribers reporting that they had not even been notified when it was uploaded. YouTube considered the subject matter too quote-unquote controversial, I guess. It seems like simply mentioning certain topics alerts the controversial censorship police and your video is not favored by the typical algorithms. Which is a shame because I got several messages from fans who said that the video was a really great breakdown of the evidence in a well-formulated argument presented in a very impartial and knowledgeable format. The incident and similar incidents I have had with the YouTube algorithm have definitely made me more cautious about what topics I handle on my channel, unfortunately, because I know certain subjects will get censored. I think some major changes should be made to YouTube's review process when it comes to these subjects as many creators will be afraid to tackle serious and important topics in our day and age. It's not really about the revenue, although that part doesn't help. It's about creators being penalized for addressing serious issues that should definitely be addressed in popular media. <sighs> YouTube can be a little exhausting sometimes. That was just the people who made these videos within a week's notice. But trust me, every history tuber has dealt with the problems of Team YouTube actively inhibiting their ability to reach the public. Which is why I made the Project Demonized playlist to add any history tubers later videos, as well as a few that came before. The suppression of historical content is a severe problem. We cannot allow Google, who operates YouTube, to continue unchallenged. They support atrocity denial. If one of the biggest monopolies in the world was in league with neo-Nazis and Klansmen, would we allow it to continue existing? I hope not. And that's what Google is. Corporations still have to operate in accordance with their charter. A long time ago, corporations were only chartered if they were seen as part of the public good. But as transcontinental railroads gained power, they created national trusts and eventually this new form of capitalism monopolized every major industry. The government eventually responded in the early 20th century by busting those trusts. What's up, bitches? We can do that again. When YouTube controls what history gets seen by the public, that is a power too great for anyone to wield, which inevitably leads to corruption as we have seen here. I don't know what a non-monopolistic YouTube looks like, but we need a radical change to prevent bigotry from ruling over the world's primary mode of interaction, as in the internet. That's why I say trust bust Google. They have too much power and with that, too much corruption. It's time to fix them. So that's a lot to talk about and suffice it to say, I'm exhausted. I am tired of Earth. So I'm going on hiatus, everyone. Don't know for how long.